once again we rejoice in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, for this opportunity of sending this telecast right there into your home. This telecast, The Life of Triumph, is sponsored by the Altoona Bible Church, the warm-hearted church with the heartwarming message, the family church. And now the choir singing for us, To the Mountain. <laughs> for us on the cross of Calvary. Jesus left heaven 
to die in my place. What mercy, what love, and what grace. I am not worthy the least of his favor, but he is preparing a place where I shall dwell with my glorified Savior forever to look on his face. I am not worthy, this dull tongue repeats it. I am not worthy, this heart gladly beats it. Jesus left heaven to die in my place. What mercy, what love, and what grace. How desolate my life would be. How dark and drear my nights and days. If Jesus' face I could not see, to brighten all earth's weary ways. I'm overshadowed by this light. Love eternal, changeless, pure, overshadowed by His mighty love, rest serene, eternal love. He died to ransom me from sin.
now we have our nursery department under Ellen Little, and they will have their part in our Christmas program. All the time I fly in the United States or Pennsylvania when I have a Christmas day. for us.
And now Don and Bill singing for us over the Sunset Mountain. The Life of Christ, sponsored by the Altoona Bible Church, the warm-hearted church with the heartwarming message, the Family Church. We're located at Union Avenue, 31st Street on Route 36, in the Columbia Park section of Altoona, Pennsylvania. Now we'd like to invite you to our services tonight. You know, this is a big day for us. July 19th is a great milestone in the history of the Altoona Bible Church. Just six years ago today, we moved into our new building here at Union Avenue and 31st Street. And how thankful we are for this building. Just about eight years ago, we started our church. And as we went about trying to build this church, to erect this church, we had bankers, businessmen, all tell us it's impossible for a new group without any collateral to put up a church worth about $200,000, $250,000. So it can't be done. But we knew what was possible because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today this church is here as a monument to the faithfulness of God. Not the faithfulness of man, but the faithfulness of God. And six years ago we moved into this building with great rejoicing in our hearts. And how we praised Him for the way that He's watched over us through these years. And today is our sixth anniversary being in this building. And we always set this day aside as a day of thanksgiving to rejoice in our wonderful Savior. We always have special meetings. And so today we have this splendid singer with us, Jimmy McDonald. He sings for Percy Crawford and his telecast and his radio programs. As you know, he has the Young People's Church of the Air and also Youth Arama there in Philadelphia. And our brother Jimmy, I believe, is one of the outstanding soloists for Jesus Christ today. We know that you'll thrill as he sings. And we'd like to have you come and be with us tonight. I know he has the ability just to make this old auditorium arms just rock. Because he has such power and he sings with the love of God in his heart. So you'll be sure to come and be with us tonight for this special service. Of course we'll be bringing a message from God's word. But we'd love to have you come and fellowship with us tonight. On this great day of anniversary. Then on Wednesday night. Prayer meeting. Bible study. I'd like to have you come, if you can, with your Bible, your prayer request. Still looking into the Bible and studying how to study the Bible. What rules must we use? How can we be systematic 
You know, a good many years ago, I decided there was something I had to do. I had to have a systematic theology. Too often, folks take a scripture from here and from here, and then they get a doctrine, and later on they get another doctrine, and they find that they clash. I have one man who writes to me, and uh, he loves to do that sort of thing. His doctrines all conflict, but he can't seem to see it. But nevertheless, that is one of the sins of the day. People claiming they love the Bible, but they do not know the Bible in reality. The Bible must be studied, for God says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's what we've been studying for weeks now. How to rightly divide the word of truth. How can we be systematic in our doctrine? So you come and be with us on Wednesday night. Then next Sunday, Sunday school at 9.30. Morning worship service at 10.45. Young people at 6.15 and that big service of the week. 7.15 in the evening. And now the choir singing for us, Hallelujah for the Cross. here in this portion of scripture. Paul opens up Romans, the 8th chapter, with no condemnation for the believer. He ends this chapter with no separation for the believer. Now listen to what he says as he closes this portion of scripture. For I am persuaded. 
Now, Paul, be sure of this. For I am persuaded that neither death, we're going to stop there, and go down, shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Hold on, I just want to talk about that one fact, one section of it. I am persuaded that death is not able to separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wonderful, isn't it? Now that word death, listen to it. For I am persuaded that neither death, death, startling word, isn't it? You know what it does? It makes strong men tremble. The word death makes weak men cringe in fear. Death. The word that all of us hate. But I said I had some experiences that brought this word home to my heart just lately. Well, death can be viewed from two different ways as far as natural man is concerned. He can look at death and it's an ordinary thing. Then on the other hand, he can look at death and it's an extraordinary thing. Now what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, death is ordinary. It's everywhere about it. You can walk down the street. Funeral procession comes down the street and goes by you and... Uh, it's so ordinary, you'll look up, and then look down at something else, and you'll not even give it the second glance. Funeral procession? See them every day. Nothing extraordinary about a funeral procession. It's just an ordinary thing. Or you can pick up your newspapers, especially after a weekend, long weekend holiday of the summer. We'll say July 4th. You'll be able to pick up your newspaper, and you'll have the headline, How many hundreds have been slaughtered on our highways? You'll look at it and you'll shudder and you'll go on and turn to the funny. Just a note and everything. We accept it. Or you can pick up your newspaper and you can look at the obituaries and you can look down and the names may make sense to you or they may be just some names you don't even recognize. You'll turn right over to the sport page. It'll not make any impression upon you. For death is ordinary. Happens every day. People are dying all about you. It's an ordinary thing. But you know, in every life, listen to me now, your life, your home right there, you're listening to my voice. Death will one of these days, and maybe sooner than you think, be not an ordinary thing, but an extraordinary thing. That's right. Death will cease from being ordinary, and it will be extraordinary. Someone in your own family circle will be snatched away by death. You will be face to face with what the world calls the Grim Reaper. And death will not be ordinary, it will be extraordinary. Oh, beloved. Well, to think of that. This came home to me because I had a young girl come to me. And she said, you know, Pastor, I've been told by my doctors I'm going to die by such a day. And I said, is that so? She said, yes. She said, Pastor, I'm afraid to die. I'm afraid to die. I said, well, that's, that's not true. Afraid to die. What would you say if the doctor came to your home or had you in the hospital and said, now, you have an incurable disease, you're going to die before six weeks are up. What would you say? How would you feel? Death would no longer be ordinary, it would be extraordinary. What if your wife or your husband received the verdict that they had an incurable disease and they were to die very shortly? Death would no longer be ordinary, it would be personal, it would be extraordinary. It would be right in your family circle and you'd feel, you wouldn't uh, say you'd just pass by and not give it a second glance. Beloved, your heart would be stunned within your, but it's going to happen, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. It's going to reach into your home, it's going to reach into my home. But you know why death strikes fear into the hearts of men and women? They don't think about it. They're not ready for it, it can't happen to me. It's all right for somebody else, that neighbor, or those folks down on the other farm, or those folks down on the other end of town, but it's not going to happen to me. But beloved, it is. It is. Beloved, God said, if you want to know anything about death, the only place you're going to find out about it is in this book. And you know what you're going to do then? You're going to say, well now, what is death? What happens when I die? You better think about it, beloved, because it's going to come sooner or later. Well, listen to what Paul says. For I am persuaded that death shall not separate me from the love of God as it is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Listen to it. Not one single instant of separation. I am persuaded that death shall not separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Oh, how many folks try to tell us we go to the grave and sleep? Or some other folks tell us, well, we're all not sure. We don't know anybody who died and came back. Yes, we do. Paul had died before he wrote Romans 8, 38 and 39. He's been brought to life again. And Paul said, I'm persuaded that that's not going to separate me from the love of God. I'm not going to die for one instant. Oh, my body may, but I'll not. Let me get some other scriptures to show you there's no separation. No separation because of death. In 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, Paul brings the same story home to our hearts. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 6, he says, knowing that therefore we are always confident. He said in Romans 8, 38, we are persuaded. Here he said we're confident. Listen to it. Knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Then the eighth verse. We are confident or persuaded. And I say willing rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Wonderful, isn't it? Death is not able to separate us from God for one instant, for one second, for one minute, for one hour, for one week, for one year. It's all that, isn't it? It's all that. Right in the blood. You know, some folks say, well, you go to the grave and sleep. May I, may I show you the soul sleepers, how foolish their argument is? Here in 2 Corinthians 5, 6, let me read it for you. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're not soul sleeping in the grave. Now let me read the eighth verse. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be unconscious in the grave, soul sleeping. Would that make sense? Paul would have been willing to be absent. No, that, he's not talking about resurrection. That's what some of the soul sleepers would tell you, but he's not. He says when we are absent from the body, we're present with the Lord. He doesn't say that we're present in another body. This body. When we're absent from it, we're present with the Lord. That instant, death is not able to separate the child of God from his maker, his Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me show you another scripture that shows you the same thing. No separation, not for even an instant. Portion of scripture that I know you're familiar with. The 23rd Psalm, we brought you a series of messages from it just a few weeks back. Here in the 23rd Psalm, we have a wonderful fact about no separation because of death. Not an instant of separation. Maybe I'll give this illustration before I turn to this portion of Scripture. We'll say there's an aged mother, and she has a boy. And he's stationed in the armed services overseas, perhaps in Germany. And all she ever talks about is when her boy John is going to be coming back to the shore and be home with her again. And she'll say, when John's home, he'll dig up the garden for me. When John's home, he'll take care of that shelf up there. When John's home, he'll paint my room. When John's home, he'll see that I have some companionship. And then one day, a knock comes on the door. The aged mother goes and opens the door, and sure enough, right there on the threshold stands John, her son. And she cries out, John, you're home! Now, you notice the change in the personal pronoun? While he was away, she kept saying, when John comes home, he will do this, and he will do that, and he'll do the other thing. But when John was right there in her presence at the threshold, she cried out, John, you're home from the third person to the second person. Notice that. John, you're home. No longer he will do this or he'll do that. Well, in the 23rd Psalm, we have that same thing. Let me read Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now notice this. He, notice the personal pronoun, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He will do this and he does this and he does. It's speaking of a Lord who is not actually there with the shepherd. It's a distant Lord. He will do this and he'll do that. But in the fourth verse, the, the writer has this to say. The Lord who is my shepherd. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now notice. For thou art with me. Notice the change in the personal pronoun. Before he leads me, he guides me, he directs me. But now thou art with me. When death comes, it changes. Thou art with me right here. No separation. Notice the fifth verse. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest. Notice the change after death comes in. The change in the personal pronoun from he to thou. Oh, beloved. I am persuaded that death shall not be able to separate me from the love of God as it is in Christ Jesus, our wonderful Lord and Savior. 
you know? Oh, death is a terrible word. You may pretend that death doesn't frighten you. You may say, well, death is expected and you're ready to die. But, beloved, when that awful reality of death strikes into your family, circle will strike fear into your heart, unless you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Listen to me. You know, the Christian can stand by the grave of a loved one who has died in the Lord Jesus Christ and he can give a triumphant cry of joy. Why? Death is not able to separate the believer from God. Not for an instance. No separation for the child of God. Death means absent from the body and presence with the Lord. Do you know Jesus Christ? Oh, I pray that you do. He's a wonderful Savior. He's better than that bank account you have. He's much better than that car that you're driving. He's much better than that religious service that you have. He's much better than that good life that you're living. He is best of all. Do you know him? The choir is singing, look to the Lamb of God. Are you looking to him? Are you trusting him? Oh, I pray that you are. So until next Sunday, same time, same station, this is Pastor Cope saying, keep looking up. Oh,